I hope everyone can see the screen. Yeah. So, uh, Robert Cialdini, uh, I uh, came across the mention of his uh, book in a book of by Scott Adams. Uh, where he, he, you know, he repeatedly uh, mentioned mentioned uh, this book as well as his other book. I'll I'll mention I'll I'll tell you about the other book uh, towards the end of this. So uh, and I was quite enamored. You know, wow, this book really seems like a gold mine of uh, wisdom and uh, knowledge. And I I picked it up at the at the first opportunity, and uh, I made sure that I you know did not. Uh, you know, take the Kindle version, but I bought the um, the hard copy, and boy, am I glad! So, this book, uh, being coming from a branding and marketing background, this book also had that kind of a relevance for me, uh, because the kind of insights, customer insights, that he talks about. Some of them were really eye-opening for me, uh, in spite of the fact that I've been in this domain for the last 31 years, but those were amazing. So let's get started. First of all, let's get to know the author. So uh, he is an American psychologist and academic, and uh, also the Regents Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Marketing at Arizona State University, and, ha and was a visiting professor of marketing Business and Psychology at Stanford University. Uh, this is his introduction in um, extremely concise form. He has done a lot. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are reams and reams of content on him on the net. All right. So now about the book. <laughs> so this is... Uh, uh, what he, you know, he is a hardcore academic. Yeah. And when he wrote this book, uh, he, he quotes this right at the beginning. You have never heard true condescension until you have heard the word popularizer. He, this guy has popularized psychology. And he, he was one of the pioneers who being um, such hardcore academics, they deliberately uh, set out to make this subject uh, you know, uh, approachable and understandable to the common man. Yeah. So this book is written in a non-academic conversational style, and it is now considered one of the most important books on the subject of consumer consumer psychology. Over five million copies have been sold worldwide. Imagine five million copies. Yeah. So I what I have done in this uh, particular review is I have taken highlights from each chapter and I am going to talk about those highlights, right? So, but first, the story of how this book came along. This is very interesting. Okay. Okay. So, uh, he says, the call came from a friend who had opened a native Indian jewelry store in Arizona. She was giddy with a curious piece of news. Something fascinated, fascinating had just happened. And she thought, as a psychologist, I might be able to explain it. The story involved a certain allotment of turquoise jewelry she had been having trouble selling. It was the peak of the tourist season. The store was unusually full of customers and the turquoise pieces were of good quality for the prices she was asking. Yet, they had not sold. My friend had attempted a couple of standard sales tricks to get them moving. She tried calling attention to them by shifting the location to a more central display area with no luck. She even told her sales staff to push the items again without success. Finally, the night before leaving on an out-of-town buying trip, she scribbled an exasperated note to her head saleswoman. Everything in this display case, price X one by two. Okay, X one by two, hoping just to be rid of the offending pieces, even if at a loss. When she returned a few days late, later, she was not surprised to find that every article had been sold. She was shocked, though. She was shocked, though, to discover that because the employee had read the one by two 
in a scrolled language as a two. The entire allotment had sold at twice the original price. <laughs> the, so the psychology of, of customers is at display over here. So that made him, uh, you know, decide that, okay, I need to write a book on this. Okay. So here's the first chapter. It's called Levers of Influence. And these are all quotations. The quotations that I have put over here are all quotations that, that he himself has put with, with these chapters. Okay. So, huh. are we any better than turkeys? So, he talks about these turkeys who have this, um, uh, you know, an uncanny habit that they will try to, uh, you know, protect, uh, 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 you know, whatever makes that particular sound. Just one second. Let me take out uh, that particular passage. The way it has been written is uh, really beautiful. Just hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, okay. Okay. All right. Here it is. And uh, okay. Uh, okay. So right after this, this particular story that I uh, uh, narrated, he says, I thought I knew what had happened, but told her that if I were to explain things properly, she wouldn't have to listen to a story of mine. Actually, it isn't my story. It's about mother turkeys and it belongs to the science of ethology, the study of animals in their natural setting. Turkey mothers are good mothers, loving, watchful, and protective. They spend much of their time tending, warming, cleaning, and huddling their young beneath them, but there is something odd about their method. Virtually all of their mothering is triggered by one thing, the cheap, cheap sound of young turkey chicks. Other identifying features of the, of the chicks, such as smell, touch, or appearance, seem to play minor roles in the mothering process. If a chick makes the cheap, cheap noise, its mother will care for it. If not, the mother will ignore or sometimes kill it. The extreme reliance of maternal tur turkeys on this one sound was dramatically illustrated in an experiment involving a mother turkey and a stuffed polecat. Imagine polecat, okay? For a mother turkey, a polecat is a natural predator whose approach is to be greeted with squawking, pecking, clawing rage. Indeed, the experiment found even a stuffed model of a polecat when drawn by a string of, to, a, to a mother turkey received an immediate and furious attack. However, when the same stuffed replica carried inside it a small recorder that played the cheap, cheap sound of, of baby turkeys, the mother not only accepted the upcoming enemy, oncoming enemy, but gathered it underneath her. Uh, when the machine was torn, turned off, the polecat mo model again drew a vicious attack. So he talks about this click run instinct that is there not just in humans, but even in animals. And I, I guess that it's the same kind of a gene set which carries through the animal world. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, for example, in, 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 the, in, in the story um, before this, it is it is our uh, instinct that and uh, you know that anything which is expensive is has to be you know it, that is good so that is a click run uh, instinct that that is that gets to be uh, that gets played over there all right now another another interesting one where he talks about this uh, case study of of these, uh, this queue in front of a photocopy ma machine. And these guys, th th there was one uh, uh, researcher who uh, he, he had this, um, you know, he went in with a sheaf of papers and he said, excuse me, can, can you allow me to uh, do these photocopies because I'm in a hurry. Huh? Now, he says that 
he kept changing the second sentence with every test but because that word because was used almost in every case he got the same response where uh, and people uh, you know gave him the right of way and allowed him to use the photocopy machine before that whereas when he did not use because he was not allowed that much you know the the percent of uh, people who uh, uh, allowed them to break the line was very little so just what is that click run over here it is that word because he says it does not matter much what what is you know uh, following that because the person uh, always uh, will uh, you know the, the, you know the, the, our mind works in such a way that okay there it's a valid reason fine let that person go okay now come to, coming to the second chapter which is on reciprocation and this is the line that he gives with that and here are some interesting case, case studies all right the christmas card experiment this is where they uh, you know he says several years ago a university professor tried a little experiment he sent christmas cards to a sample of perfect strangers although he expected some re reaction the response he received was amazing holiday cards addressed to him came pouring back from people who had neither met nor heard of him the great majority of those who returned cards never inquired into the identity of the unknown professor they received his holiday greeting card click and run again the same instinct basic instinct which is at play over here they mechanically sent one in return yeah so reciprocity this in this chapter he he talks about this reciprocity uh, uh, click and run uh, instinct that we have okay now the cuban missile crisis this is very interesting one i think all of you must be knowing about this particular cuban missile crisis that happened in the 60s when uh, kennedy was uh, uh, in power so uh, for those who do not know uh, uh, russia started stocking its nuclear missiles in cuba which is like the back door of uh, you know backyard of uh, uh, usa and <laughs> for a good two weeks there was a standoff between us and uh, uh, ussr at that time it was ussr and the whole world waited with bated breath expecting a nuclear showdown okay finally they reached an agreement and uh, ussr they uh, uh, you know they, they they removed all the all the nuclear missiles from cuba and it is only later uh, you know in the 80s or 90s that documents were declassified and it uh, turned out that uh, this particular uh, you know back down that uh, from ussr was not because of some you know the the charisma or or the sale uh, or the any other um, uh, you know aggressive technique uh, uh, that uh, uh, kennedy used but it was actually about reciprocity usa in turn had taken away uh, removed the, uh, the the nuclear missiles from turkey and other neighboring countries of ussr in return for this but in the agreement they had specified that this particular fact should not be mentioned so this is again another very famous example of of reciprocity that that has happened all right the amway bug so amway uh, you guys must be knowing again they have this direct selling method and hold on and what they do is they give these um, baskets of you know um, these items which are of everyday use what what happens is that a salesman of amway or whoever is the representative um, in 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 their case the customer and the salesman is the same thing so they go they give this basket to um, say a resident of, of a particular house and they say you are free to use it for say 24 hours 48 hours whatever uh, 72 hours whatever 
at at no cost no obligation please use all of these products and i will come say day after or or the day after that and i will i will collect whatever is not used so this they call the amway bug and before this amway sales were you know not nothing to write home about but the moment they introduced this particular sales technique they saw a huge uptick in their sales why simply that you know when you receive a, a gift which is for free you know you are you are conditioned you are programmed to reciprocate so this is another example that he gives of reciprocity okay now coming to liking this is the third chapter liking okay and this is the quotation that that he gives with that okay ah so <laughs> why do we like someone this is uh, quite interesting why do we like someone guys why do we like i i'm asking everyone this question why do we like someone have we put a thought to why do we like someone what are the things that make us like someone anyone who can unmute themselves and and tell me he has listed Hello. down 1 2 3 4 number 5 uh, attributes five things why we end, end up liking someone yes monica um because they like us you know again right. maybe reciprocity you know they like us that's all why right. we like them all right all right all right anyone else i had read somewhere that uh, generally i like you because i am like you is uh, a big truth pardon i read somewhere uh -huh. i read somewhere that i like you because i am like you oh okay so i am familiarity, like yeah, so ah. familiarity yeah familiarity and ah. uh, relatability is a big factor right, in right in right right, right. Like, similarity like, is, yes 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 yeah. all right so he lists down these attributes so these are the attributes number one physical attractiveness this is at number one you know whether we like this fact or not whether we admit to it or not people who are physically attractive they are like more they are trusted more that's why you will see uh, you know in elections better looking candidates they win okay and then coming to what sunit uh, just mentioned similarity yeah i like you because you are like <laughs> because i am like you huh? so similarity is another one compliments people who praise you get to be liked yeah then contact and cooperation people with whom we are in contact with people with whom we cooperate they they get liked and conditioning as an association so in conditioning and association here he talks about something interesting let me read it out to you all right yeah okay first let me read out what he says on contact and cooperation he says often we don't realize our attitude towards something has been influenced by the number of times we have been exposed to it for example in a study of online advertising now listen to this in a study of online advertising banner ads for a camera were flashed 5 times 20 times or not at all at the top of an article participants read the more frequently the ad appeared the more the participants came to like the camera remember these ads are just flashing you are not even conscious that they are flashing okay but in spite of that because this uh, 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 you know you are getting in contact with that particular communication you are you are uh, you end up liking that more okay so that is for contact and cooperation and uh, where yeah, okay, conditioning and association yes all right so <laughs> he talks about a very interesting uh, case where uh, uh, he, this is about how he write it he writes it and i would like to quote him why do they blame me doc it was a shaky telephone voice of a local tv weatherman 
he had been given my number when he called the psychology department at my university to find someone who could answer his question. And what was the question? One that had always puzzled him, but had recently begun, begun to bother and depress him. And what is the question? I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? Everybody knows that I just report the weather, that I don't order it, right? So how come I get so much flag when the weather is bad? During the floods last year, I got hate mail. One guy threatened to shoot me if it didn't stop raining. Hell, I'm still looking over my shoulder from, from that one. And the people I work with at the station do it too. Sometimes right on the air, they'll zing me about a heat wave or something. They have to know that I am not responsible. But that doesn't stop them. Can you help me understand this, Doc? It's really getting me down. <laughs> Conditioning and association. The carriers of bad news are also, uh, you know, uh, you know, we 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 have heard in uh, stories during our childhood. Uh, if you remember, Kevo, uh, you know, Raja Rani and you know, even Mughals and all. If the you know, there used to be a kind of a uh, uh, you know, kind of a contest of who will go and tell the good news to. To the king okay and if it is bad news people would really people around the king would would not be uh, like would not like to be the ones who would be uh, known as carriers of bad news because of this that association if i get associated with bad news then you know <laughs> the this thing happens Okay, and uh, <laughs> this reminds me of another interesting one. Uh, my my partner at Grey Leap, he's also a big time stock trader. He's a technical, uh, he's in te technical trading, Atul Goswami. So as it so happens, every time I go and sit across him uh, at in his cabin just to talk about something or whatever, he starts making profit. Yeah. So every time that uh, you know I'm there, he he makes me he makes me sit, and you know the, his uh, the, the the amount that he likes me. I now I and after reading this chapter, it it has dawned on me that maybe it is because of this. <laughs> yeah, this association of me being the carrier of good news, <laughs> right? Okay. Now coming to the next one, social proof. Social proof, what exactly is social proof? It is the fact that, okay, so many people are doing it, so it must be right, okay? So here, he talks about, firstly, firstly Netflix, okay? How Netflix learned its lesson. Although not all retailers understand how to harness popularity profitably, media giant Netflix, learned that lesson from its own data and began operating on it immediately. According to technology and entertainment reporter, Nicole Laporte, the company had long prided itself on not on, on being, on being highly secretive about things like watch time and ratings. They never used to divulge these things because for them, it is a proprietary information. Okay. But then in an unexpected 2018 policy re reversal, it began offloading reams of information about its most successful offerings. As Laporte puts it, in its letter to shareholders, Netflix rattled off titles and how many people had streamed them in a way that felt like a drunken sailor had taken over the normally heavily fortified battleship and was spilling trade secrets. Now, the moment this happened, 2018 was a watershed year for them. It was a turnaround year for them. Because the moment people started actually seeing, okay, these, these are the popular shows. These are the popular movies. So many people are watching. So they started also watching those. And, and the viewership of Netflix in total, had, it grew. Okay. okay, Toyota recruitment process. This is another very interesting one. Okay. Where is Toyota? Okay, yeah. All right. Okay. 
So this was a dealership of Toyota in Oklahoma. And it says, uh, this is a case study that he quotes, that one of the biggest challenges we face is getting quality sales talent. So he is quoting uh, the ownership, owner of the dealership. We had seen poor return on our newspaper ads, so we decided to run our recruitment ads on radio during the after work drive time. We ran an ad that focused on the great demand for our vehicles, how many people were buying them, and consequently, how we needed to expand our sales force to keep up. As we hoped, we saw a significant jump in the number of applications to join our sales team. But the biggest effect we saw was an increase in customer flow traffic, an increase in sales in both the new and used vehicle departments, and a noticeable difference in the attitudes of our customers. It was, it was a recruitment ad for hiring salespeople, but the way they articulated it is that we are not being able to handle so many customers. So we need help in that. And the, and the pleasant offshoot of that was that they actually started getting more customers because, you know, when you hear, oh my God, these guys are getting so many customers, they need help with that. They must be really good. Yeah, again, click run. Uh -huh. Okay, Guardian's Cult. Now this is, you know, it was a, it's a little hair raising because uh, this gives you a, a peep into how cults operate and how they manage to not only bring uh, get so many followers, but also keep them, uh, uh, you know, uh, make them stick to them. Okay. Uh, okay. This is where, okay, I'll just give you a, a give, give you the gist of it, that this was a cult which was formed by uh, two, uh, two of these, uh, uh, and, and these uh, people who you see on screen, Marian Keech, and there was another gentleman, okay, okay, Dr. Thomas Armstrong and Mrs. Marian Keech, okay. They were physicians and they formed this cult where Marian Keech used to, you know, say, you know, she's getting uh, uh, sort of uh, messages from the higher powers. And she used to do this, um, you know, uh, this particular action and, and people used to jot down according to that, people used to jot down okay, what exactly the message is. And one of the messages that she, um, uh, that everyone jotted down what happened to be that the world will come to an end. You know, the aliens will come over and at 12, 12 at night, on one particular night, they will take the entire, all the followers of this cult, they will beam them up and they will take them away with them and the rest of the world will be flooded and everyone will, uh, you know, will vanish. So, these guys used to be very uh, secretive about um, their, their cult. And that particular night, all the, you know, their cult members, they, they gathered in, in, the, in their compound. And the clock started ticking and everyone was waiting with bated breath. But 12 o'clock happened. It, and it passed and around four o'clock, she, Marian Keech, she sort of gave some, you know, explanation about why it has not happened. That because all of us are gathered over here, God has pardoned the entire human race and therefore it has not happened. And that particular uh, calamity has not happened. Now, to someone who, uh, you know, who has been following these guys, to an outsider, it might seem that after such a, um, you know, fiasco, that people's belief in, the, in them will automatically, you know, vanish and the cult will, uh, you know, disappear. But the opposite happened. And people 
who are part of the cult became even stronger followers of the cult they also they you know they started uh, calling up newspapers and other media to 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 propagate the cult you know this is something that we see around us even today once you have bought into an ideology then no matter how many facts are counter to what you believe in every time a fact comes comes at people they their belief actually grows stronger okay so that that is all about social proof they it is about and this is again about a very deep rooted rooted uh, psychology okay going on okay the world's first shopping cart <laughs> this is also another interesting case where uh, he talks about this guy called silvan goldman you know he acquired uh, several small grocery stores in 1934 and he noticed his customers stopped buying when their handheld shopping baskets got too heavy so what was the issue that when uh, um, these customers they they used to carry their baskets when it used to get too heavy they used to stop buying and just go to the billing counter and and check out so he came up with this idea that of these shopping carts now to begin with these this was completely alien to those shoppers they they just did not take to this idea they said what is this rubbish and uh, they did not take to this idea so what he did was he hired some shoppers whose job was only to go around uh, that particular grocery uh, store just with with filled up shopping carts and pretend to be shopping and when others saw this it's only then that that this idea caught on he you know uh, uh, this guy uh, silvan goldman he patented this design and by uh, uh, this shopping cart and just on this he died an extremely wealthy man with a 400 million dollar estate when he died again social proof at work you see someone else doing that and you, all of a sudden you start accepting yeah all right so this is how i found really hilarious this is a case of a london tube breakdown okay so this is how it goes i would like to quote him verbatim while in london visiting my girlfriend i was sitting in an underground station on a stopped train okay sitting in an underground station on a stopped train the fray the train failed to depart on time and there was no announcement as to the cause on the opposite side of the platform another train had stopped too then a strange thing happened a few people started leaving my train and boarding the other one which sparked a self feeding self amplifying reaction making everybody which is about 200 people including me he says this december my train and board the other then after several minutes something even more peculiar happened a few people started leaving the second train and the whole mechanism was produced again in the reverse order making everybody including me once again go back to the original train still without any announcement to justify the retreat needless to say it left me with a rather silly feeling of being a mindless turkey following every collective impulse of social proof <laughs> yeah just because everyone is doing it you are doing it right ke wo yaad hai wo bachpan mein mummy daddy ya dada dadi bolte the sab log kuye mein kudoge tab kudoge kya the answer is yes yeah okay now coming to authority oh, okay in authority i have taken only one uh case study that he uh, from the whole chapter but i would like you to pay attention this is a milestone experiment in psychology okay and it it 
throws such an interesting light on the motivation of human beings and you will be able to put in context you know all the horrific uh, acts that people have done under despots and dictators okay this is the milgram study okay so now i will read out from here pay attention uh, it is a, a slightly longish one but by the end of it you will be um, you know quite amazed by the uh, by the results of this okay now this is it suppose while leafing through your new local newspaper you notice an ad for volunteers to take part in a study of memory being done in the psychology department of a nearby university suppose further that finding the data and that the idea of such an experiment intriguing you contact the director of the study professor stanley milgram and make arrangements to participate in an hour long session when you arrive at the laboratory suite you meet two men one is the researcher in charge of the experiment clearly evidenced by the gray lab coat he wears and the clipboard he carries the other is a volunteer like you uh, who seems quite average in all respects after initial greetings and pleasantries are exchanged the researcher begins to uh, explain the procedures to be followed he says the experiment is a study of how punishment how punishment affects learning and memory therefore one participant will have the task of learning pairs of words in a long list until each pair can be recalled perfectly okay this person is to be called the learner the other participant's job will be to test the learner's memory and to deliver increasingly strong electric shocks for every mistake this person will be designated the teacher okay so one is a learner the second is a teacher naturally you get a bit nervous at this news your apprehension increases when after drawing lots with your partner you find that you are assigned the learner role okay you hadn't expected the possibility of pain as part of the study so you briefly consider leaving but no you think there's plenty of time for that if need be and besides how strong a shock could it be after you have had a chance to study the list of word pairs the researcher straps you into a chair and the teacher looking on attaches electrodes to your arm more worried now about the effect of the shock you inquire into its severity the researcher's response is hardly comforting he says although the shocks can be extremely painful they will cause you no permanent tissue damage <laughs> okay with that the researcher and teacher leave you alone and go to the next room by, where the teacher asks you the test questions through an intercom system and delivers electric punishment for every wrong response as the test proceeds you quickly recognize the pattern the teacher follows he asks the question and waits for your answer over the intercom whenever you err you he announces the voltage of the shock you are about to receive and pulls a lever to deliver the punishment the most troubling thing is, is the shock is the shock increases by 15 volts with each error you make the first part of the test progresses smoothly the shocks are annoying but tolerable later on though as you make more mistakes and the shock voltage is climbed the punishment begins to hurt enough to disrupt your concentration which leads to more errors and ever more disruptive shocks at the 75 90 or 105 volt levels the pain makes you grunt audibly at 120 volts you exclaim into the intercom that the shocks are really starting to hurt you take one more punishment with a groan and decide that you can't take much more pain after the teacher delivers the 150 volt shock you shout back into the intercom that's all get me out of here get me out of here please let me out instead of the assurance you expect from the teacher that he and the researcher are coming to release you he merely gives you the next test question to answer surprised and confused you mumble the first answer to come into your head it's wrong of course and the teacher delivers a 165 volt shock you scream at the teacher to stop to let you out he responds only with the next question and with the next slashing shock when your frenzied answer is incorrect you can't hold down the panic any longer the shocks are so strong now that make you writhe and shriek you kick the wall demand to be released and beg the teacher to help you 
Okay. Now, one is a learner, one is a teacher, and one is a researcher. The researcher is the one who is instructing the teacher to keep on giving this learner more bigger and bigger shocks. Now, the twist in this test, pay attention, please. The twist in this test is that it is actually the teacher who is the on whom the experiment is being done, not the learner. Learner is part of the research team. So what exactly is the, is, is the test being done on? That, you know, even when these, uh, these guys, the, the, teacher, the, the teacher in this particular case, even when he was, was extremely uncomfortable with putting on, uh, you know, increasing the levels of shock, seeing that person in pain and, uh, and suffering, even then, he kept on increasing the shocks simply because there was an authority figure who was instructing him to do that. Just imagine the implications of this. Like I said, you know, now think of, you know, put in the, con put, put in the context how Hitler managed to you know get all his dirty work done how he ended up inflicting so much suffering on such a large human population because people who were doing it even when they they were uncomfortable they had to follow the authority yeah so this is According to me, uh, uh, th this was an eye-opening thing for me. Yes, uh, you know this at the back of your mind. You know, you, are, you, you work for, uh, for bosses and you know many times you do unpleasant things. But how far you can, um, you know, this psychology goes, how deep it goes. This was eye-opening for me. Okay, now coming, and like I said, this is the only thing that I'll include from this chapter. Coming to the next one, scarcity. Scarcity. Now we have all seen scarcity at work in advertising. Right, Sunit? Yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. So <laughs> we've all seen this, right? And uh, we have also seen this. Right? Whenever new a new iPhone model is about to be launched, the, the, the queues in front of it, people who wait um, you know, 24 hours in advance, they, they book their slot in the queues and uh, there, there is such a feeling of, uh, you know, euphoria if they manage to get, get hold of the first iPhone. But this particular, uh, you know, uh, rule of scarcity also came to bite a well-known brand on its backside. Can, can anyone... Guess the name of that brand? They tried to do something. It's a very well-known case study. And they tried to do something. They tried to do something new, but they failed miserably. And that brand was this, the new Coke. Uh, anyone who is in, in marketing um, will know this case study that at one point in time, Coke did these taste uh, studies and they found that another flavor, slightly different from the traditional Coke flavor, was proving to be a, uh, uh, you know, more enjoyable to customers. So this was a blind taste test that they had done. So they announced that they are going to discontinue the tradition that Coke, the the Coke Act as people uh, knew it uh, till then, and they are going to introduce new Coke. They were not prepared for the reaction from the customers. 
you know, just thinking of the possibility that the taste that they have grown up with, the taste that has been part of their life, you know, the drink that has been part of their life is not going to be there anymore. There were mass protests. There were mass protests. There were like, there were, uh, you know, uh, uh, litigations were filed in courts to, to stop Coke from discontinuing the old, old uh, Coke and all that. There were, there was an association that was, that was formed to, to protect the, uh, the traditional Coke. With the result that finally, Coke gave up and they gave up the idea of new Coke and reverted to the traditional Coke. They just bowed to the public pressure. Again, that scarcity at work. When people got to know that, uh, uh, that this is, is something that, that is not going to be there anymore, the love for it, the affinity for it grew even stronger. Yeah. So I, I'm sure all of us uh, must have gone through this in their personal life many times that when you are in a relationship with someone, fine, it's going on. But the moment it seems that you are going to lose this other person, that's when your love you know, grow stronger, your, your conviction grows stronger. No, no, this, this is what I want. This is whom I want in my life. So it's the same uh, psychology at, at work over there. Okay. Next one is on commitment and consistency. Yeah. Commitment and consistency. Ah, yes. This is very interesting. This this was news to me that every year Amazon ranks near or at the top of the wealthiest, best performing companies in the world. We know that, right? Yet, every year it gives each of its fulfillment center employees who help the company reach these heights an incentive of up to $5,000 to leave, to leave the company. The practice in which employees receive a cash bonus if they quit has left many observers mystified as the costs of employee turnover are significant. Direct expenses associated with turnover of such employees stemming from the recruitment, hiring and training of replacements can extend to 50% of the employee's annual compensation package. Plus the costs escalate even further when indirect expenses are taken into account in the form of loss of institutional memory productivity disruptions, and lowered morale of remaining team members. So what is at work over here? Amazon is tapping into another deep-rooted customer, you know, human psychology. When these employees are faced with this decision, uh, you know, it typically happens when they get an email from Jeff Bezos and the email is titled, please don't take up this offer. So when they make this decision to stick with the company, they say all, all it is taken up, this particular offer is taken up by very few people. Okay, that is another surprising thing. But those who, and then those who stick around, they are even more committed to the company. And why is that so? Because that decision has been made. And now they have to act in consistency with that decision. It gets really deep into their mind that no, this is, a, this is something I've decided. That's it. No turning back from now. Everything that I have, all my efforts will be for this. So this is an interesting case study, which uh, really showcases commitment and consistency. All right. This, this is another uh, interesting one where 
American prisoners of war in China, they got turned over to the Chinese ideology. Hmm? So, after the war, American psychologists questioned the returning prisoners intensively to determine what had occurred, in part because of the unsettling success of some aspects of the Chinese program. What was the Chinese program? He has explained it a bit over here. Look, okay. <clears throat> okay, let me start from here. The question of what makes a commitment effective has numerous answers. A variety of factors affects the ability of a com commitment to, to constrain future behavior. One large-scale program designed to produce compliance illustrates how several of the factors work. The remarkable thing about the program is that it has systematically, it was systematically employing these factors over a half a century ago, well before scientific research had identified them. During the Korean War, many captured American soldiers found themselves in prisoner of war camps run by Chinese communists. It became clear early in the conflict that the Chinese treated captives quite differently than did their allies, the North Koreans who faced, who favored harsh punishment to gain, gain compliance. Scrupulously avoiding brutality, the Red Chinese engaged in what they termed their lenient policy, which was in reality a concerted and sophisticated psychological assault on their captives. Now, this is what it, how it used to work. The Chinese were very effective in getting Americans to inform on one another, in striking contrast to the behavior of American POWs in World War II. For this reason, among others, escape plans were quickly uncovered and the escapes themselves almost always unsuccessful. When an escape did occur, wrote psychologist had just seen, a principal American investigator of the Chinese improvisation program in Korea. The Chinese usually recovered the man easily by offering a bag of rice to anyone turning him in. In fact, nearly all American prisoners in the Chinese camps are said to have collaborated with the enemy in one way or the other. Now, how exactly did they accomplish this kind of a compliance from prisoners of war? This is what has been explained now. An examination of the, of the prison camp program shows that the Chinese relied heavily on commitment and consistency pressures. Of course, the first, like, the first problem facing the Chinese was to get any collaboration at all from the Americans. The prisoners had been trained to provide nothing but name, rank, and serial number. Okay, This is the training of American soldiers. That this is, this is the only information that they are supposed to provide, nothing else. Short of physical brutalization, how could the captors hope to get such men to give military information, turn in fellow prisoners, or publicly denounce their country? They went to the extent of denouncing America. The Chinese answer was elementary. Start small and build. For instance, prisoners were frequently asked to make statements so mildly anti-American or pro-communist that they seemed inconsequential. You know, examples he gives, such as the United States is not perfect. And in a communist country, unemployment is not a problem. You know, these kind of statements. Once these minor requests had been complied with, however, the men found themselves pushed to submit to related yet more substantial requests. A man who had just agreed with this Chinese inter inter interrogator that the United States was not perfect might then be asked to indicate some of the ways he believed this was the case. Once he had so explained, he might be asked to make a list of these problems with America, America and sign his name to it. Later, he might be asked to read his list in a discussion group with other prisoners. After all, it's what you believe, isn't it? Still later, he might be asked to write an essay expanding on his list and discussing these problems in greater detail. Gives you an insight into how indoctrination and brainwashing, you know, the, we term, the, use the term, we uh, layman use the term brainwashing, how it happens, right? How, how malleable the human brain is when faced with such pressure. Yeah. And this kind of an assault. Okay. Now the next one, uh, next chapter is on unity. Unity is again something uh, very interesting. It is about 
how we act like people or sometimes not even people whom we are feel connected to okay in some way or the other you will be surprised by the first example that uh, that i'm going to show you and this is the example how many of you over here uh, have a pet a dog please uh, put it in the chat box sunit i know you have have a dog uh, anyone else who here who has a dog i have one okay you are ah, yes abhi also has one okay okay hitesh also has one now how many of how many times has this happened with you when the dog yawns you also yawn and when you yawn the dog also yawns yeah i have seen this happening <laughs> i had it i had a couple of dogs at one point and they used to do this so this is the concept of unity you you feel connected to someone and you uh, you know act you know you sort of mirror their actions or you feel a one one with them in that okay now coming to how this this thing this unity part um, had some really interesting um, you know case studies so this was in a nazi camp okay where uh, he says at nazi work camps when just one prisoner violated a rule it was not uncommon for all to be lined up and for a guard to walk along the line counting to 10 stopping only to shoot each 10th person dead imagine this someone in that entire group of prisoners has committed something wrong and the guards do not know and to find out find that out they will line up all of these prisoners and count to 10 and kill the 11 at uh, till the 10th uh, prisoner now in the uh, what happened over here in the roommate's telling a veteran guard assigned the task was performing it as routinely as he always had when inexplicably he did something singular this is the guard who was shooting every 10th person in the on that particular day coming to one seemingly unfortunate tenth prisoner he raised an eyebrow did a quarter turn and executed the 11th he did not kill the 10th and why was this so any guesses any guesses you can unmute yourself or you can use the chat chat window any guesses why why this, this would have happened the topic is this this uh, the, uh, the, this particular chapter is, topic is this unity so why would this have happened that, that that's a clue clue for you so uh, i am just guessing it may huh. be because uh, uh, because unity was one thing that was keeping uh, the prisoners uh, together so they wanted to break the uni unity hence they killed the 11th uh, A member and not the tenth, just to instill this fear in them. Okay, let, let, let me let me explain this concept of unity uh, again. Like this uh, statement by Mother Teresa: "If we have no peace, it's because we have forgotten that we belong to one another." Unity is basically our connectedness with one another. It is not. um uh gagan pal it is not in the sense that we use the word unity in you know ye wo hum hum ek hain wo wala ye kya wo wala nahi hai this is about the feeling of connectedness that you have with some people like like in the, some people or not the non people yeah and 
that is that is the unity that we are talking about over here okay so okay let me let me reveal the reason the maybe reason... it's because he uh, sorry to interrupt yeah please please um, please monica yes maybe it's because the 10th person had something uh, you know which made him have an you know some sort of affinity or you know bonding you know with that person in that moment i don't know you know maybe something yeah. about that person some aspect they, or something they there guess he was from the same village as the person who was shooting ah uh, see yeah yeah unity there was this that sense of unity there was that sense of oneness just because this person was from the same village and his face seemed familiar to him that's all yeah another example is that this guy ali reda he is a uh, he is in the guinness book of world record and has been crowned the world's greatest car salesman for selling more than 5 cars and trucks every day he worked in 12 straight years something he did by being a people person uh, and he used to sell the, uh, send these i like you cards ensuring they receive quick and courteous treatment when they brought their cars in for service and always giving them a fair price more recently news reports pointed to sales figures indicated that joe had been dethroned by a vehicle salesman in dearborn michigan named ali reda now first it was joe gerard i'm talking about now ali reda whose annual output out distance even the best of joe's years in interviews mr reda admitted that he closely followed joe gerard's specific recommendations for success but if ali simply imitated joe how did he manage to surpass the master so gerard was the one who was in the guinness book of record records okay now here comes this guy ali reda who is merely imitating what joe gerard did and yet he has surpassed him so the psychologists got deep into it and it turned out that the arab community in michigan felt an affinity towards him so if they have to buy a car they were you know there was no question of going to anyone else but ali ali reda again the principle of unity at work yeah by unity it is that affinity to people whom you feel connected to yeah all right so that sort of uh, brings an end uh, to this book review now in this book he has not only given us tips on you know on how to hone our persuasion skills but, but at the same time he has also given us tips on how to spot when someone is manipulating us yeah and how to resist that he gives an example a famous example now again this, this is a very famous brand name and he lists down how this particular brand uses all of these techniques to manipulate customers into buying more any guesses what this brand could be when i tell you you will you would have, I, i can hunt, i can bet my bottom dollar you would have definitely heard of this brand and this is of everyday use let me give you an example it is an everyday use in the kitchen no not so it's not apple <laughs> and target audience for this is women any more guesses all right let me reveal the brand okay okay sumit mixi no no <laughs> no okay this is a brand it's a huge brand and imagine they have built this entire brand on these kind of manipulations and the brand is tupperware yeah so these tupperware home parties 
that Tupperware customers throw. It is for their friends. So naturally, their friends are coming to the part party because they like this person, right? So <clears throat> that is liking the liking concept at work. Then reciprocation. And because he says to start, games are played and prizes won by the party goers. Anyone who doesn't win a prize gets to choose one from a grab bag so that everyone has received a gift before the buying begins. Okay. Authority. The quality and safety of Tupperware products are shown to be certified by experts. Social proof. Once the buying begins, each purchase builds the idea that other similar people want the products. Therefore, they must be good. Scarcity. Unique benefits and limited time offers are always described. Commitment and consistency. Early on, participants are urged to make a public commitment to Tupperware by describing aloud the uses and benefits they have found for the Tupperware they already own. Unity. Upon making a purchase, guests are welcome to the Tupperware family. And uh, so he quotes uh, one particular woman uh, who says that it's gotten to the point now where I hate to be invited to Tupperware parties. I've got all the containers I need. And if I wanted any more, I could buy another brand cheaper in the store. But when a friend calls up, I feel like I have to go. And when I get there, I feel like I have to buy something. What can I do? It's for one of my friends. Yeah. I recently heard that Tupperware uh, is now on a huge decline post COVID because of the changes in the in customer behavior. Yeah. Because uh, when COVID happened, these kind of parties were discontinued. So that that brought in a break from that you know that continuity that was happening uh that you know this reg how regularly these parties were happening and now the customers are buying these same containers in a completely different way they go to the store and they buy from there and tupperware in a break from their own convention they uh, traditionally they were never displayed on any in any store they were not available for for sale in any department store anywhere or at retail store anywhere but now they have started doing that in a break from there because they they also have realized that the customer buying behavior has changed so i think it's about time and i just hope that it has changed because these customers have also in some way understood that this is the kind of manipulation that was happening with them <laughs> it's a it's a it's a big hope that but anyway whatever the reason okay now these are some of the other books by the same author robert cialdini and uh, i myself have read persuasion um this is a, another amazing book on psychology and these are some of his other books that he has co-authored with others so i am assuming that they will also be good Right. So that brings us to the end of this. Uh, any questions, any observations? I would, you know, the floor is open to everyone. I had a question, Rajesh. Yes. So really an excellent presentation. I feel like I have gotten, you know, a lot of, you know, like gems from this highly influential book, very persuasive. And so uh, thank you so much for that, you know, very, uh, you know, like uh, eye-opening uh, presentation about, you know, human behavior, human psychology. My question is that uh, about, you know, like uh, the experiment with the researcher, the teacher and the learner. Uh, over there, we learned that people are willing to blindly follow authority, you know, even at a great cost. Uh, to, you know, a fellow human being. So does the, you know, author, does he write anything about how, you know, if it's a situation like this, how we can get people to unfollow, you know, authority when authority is being misused? In fact, every chapter that I enumerate, uh, that I listed down, at the end of every chapter, he has listed down a defense to that 
tactic that if you uh, if this is happening to you how to spot it and how to resist it okay let me uh, read out okay hold on is there a defense to this as well okay yes yeah so he says one protective tactic we can use against authority status is to remove its element of surprise because we typically misperceive the profound impact of authority and its symbols on our actions we become unsufficiently cautious about its presence in compliance situations the fundamental form of defense against the problem therefore is a heightened awareness of authority power when this awareness is coupled with the recognition of how easily authority symbols can be faked the benefit is a properly guarded approach to authority influence attempts you know he says it sounds simple but not you know you need, really need to practice it to implement it but th th this is what i found really uh, you know uh, gold mine in, in terms every chapter has a section on defense how to defend yourself against these kind of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, persuasion tactics so okay. nikki nikki has a question hi rajesh hi everyone good evening um is it possible to summarize key takeaways you have got from this book key takeaways a uh, good question my key takeaway would be no because i am a marketer my key takeaway would be to um, you know these are the human insights that i take away from there and how exactly the human mind works it might seem sometimes it uh, it might seem completely irrational and illogical but uh, to me that that is my take away that the human mind does not work <laughs> as per one's mind as per common sense many times and uh, you can do something to uh, number one make someone comply with uh, with you it can be at a conscious level it can be at at a subconscious level or an unconscious level and you can also at the same time become more conscious and aware about these same things happening to you this persuasion tactics happening to you and when someone is using it uh, uh, for nefarious purposes uh, how to protect yourself from from them Okay, so we can be aware like this can happen. Yes. Yes. For a customer, um, that is the main take up. In fact, he was criticized with the first edition of this book. He was criticized that you are giving marketers and others um, tools to exploit uh, human psychology, and mm -hmm. then in the later editions, he. in every chapter he put it, put this up as uh, uh, the defense section for customers on how to spot these kind of manipulations which are happening and how to protect themselves okay i also joined midway through the session so my apologies but the one i heard closely was that if there is regional background or they are coming from the same region so it's like a social circumstance how people are getting influenced and it help it happens in workplaces also right everywhere it happens so right. any learnings like how people can avoid or can come out of it so that it doesn't impact like, like let's suppose a person in power can be influenced by people who are from the same region or from same areas yeah. or some other societal reasons yeah. might impact you know uh, getting influenced so the other person how they can overcome this that that is uh, um maybe not covered in this book but then then that is fine pardon uh, come again if it is not covered in the book then it's fine i mean just uh, the, this affinity is uh, no 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 it, it has been covered this um, yeah yeah this uh, book on uh, this, this chapter on uh, hold on unity the last chapter on uh, unity that, that is what it was about 
it yeah. was your affinity to people who who have the same background or with whom you feel connected to okay. and you so see it happening covering that it will work it will be there okay that, and you see it happening um, uh, all around you you we, yeah, gra we, 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 gravitate, around. we gravitate towards people we uh, you know we have similarities with and those similarities can be something yeah, okay it always uh, happens so in 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 cases wherein the the other person who is not part of that community how they can overcome the situation if they have not covered in the book then it's fine but i was just checking if they have if he have covered anything around that then uh, sorry i didn't get your question so the affinity will be towards the person who is coming from the same family same unity right. in that sense right. same so uh, social background etc right. but right. in a group of people wherein uh -huh. it happens what other person can do to bring equations to the same level no see uh, your affinity will be from the simple point of view that that person say for example belongs to the same community or the same village or the same town so uh, the, uh, the that will be the point of similarity there uh, so uh, there is nothing that the other person needs to do overtly many times it is just uh, an accident of birth that there is that connection fine you know so therefore you are connected may i add something here is that yeah, okay please please, please please so perhaps uh, i think that maybe you know she ha may have wanted to know that like if you are in a social circle and you feel that others have affinity to each other based on some commonality could oh, be some okay. you know common okay. uh, common you know like attribute then what can somebody who feels that they don't enjoy that same okay. an affinity at that point what can they do to what bring themselves at par so i think that like you could try and make yourself more likable to the others because they're yeah. different you know like uh you know like there's a whole <laughs> yeah. there are so, a number of ways to make yourself okay, more okay. like now yeah. now i get the question now i get the question so uh, so the the entire uh, this unity chapter was the last one but before that there are six other chapters even if that particular aspect is not working in your favor but there are six other chapters right from reciprocating uh, 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 for uh, for a favor to uh, you know becoming how to become more likable than social proof all these things are um, the you know, commitment and consistency all these uh, factors you can leverage and uh, you know use to be um, become one with them yeah rajesh uh, are all these are all these of the same importance or uh, there are few which are more important than the others depends or does it depend on the context yeah, uh, or the, on the context and the situation Okay. Yeah. I had another question, actually, yeah. Rajesh. If I'm not taking away from no, somebody no, no, else's no. chance, please, please, please. Okay, thank you. So I was just thinking, what if you know a person wants to employ you know persuasion, become more persuasive, maybe in their business dealings or even on a personal level, you know, some situation where they want to feel they have they can have more influence. Uh, they, you know, read, you know, very insightful books such as this. And there are, num you know, it gives a lot of examples about, you know, how, you know, human psychology has worked very demonstra demonstrably, you know, in the marketplace or even in other scenarios. So we can learn from there. But let's say I'm faced with a circumstance and I say I want to, you know, be more persuasive here. Then how do I go around identifying what would be a useful strategy for myself? You know how can I how can I do that? Uh, according to me, that is not something that uh, you will you know it will just dawn on you immediately. That okay, this is the this is what I need to do. This is something that you need to uh, the learnings of this book is something that you need to internalize first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and yeah. then and only then will you be in a position to. Take a call, and then you'll have to practice it over a period of time. You know, and then you'll come to a stage where these things will start coming instinctively to you. 
Yes, mm-hmm. I guess we have to really understand the context, you know, yeah, of the situation exactly, and exactly, uh, what exactly. we're trying to, you know, use for that. And one thing I, I found uh, uh, very useful over here is to <clears throat> uh, not only, um, you know, it is not just about using these techniques, I would call them techniques or tools, but at the same time, being conscious that yeah. you are not misusing them. Yes. Definitely. Whatever. And you're yes. not allow- you're not allowing anyone else to misuse them over you either. Absolutely. Yeah. Whatever you do should be done within an ethical framework. Yeah. All right, uh, Sukhvinda, you had a question. Yes. All right, Amit. Thank you so much. It was great to have you here. Any other question or should we wrap up? So how did you feel about his defenses? Like Rajesh, you shared with us that, you know, for um, each chapter, he has also given uh, how, right. you know, so people can spot, you know, manipulation uh, or, you know, stuff. or an, an unfair, you know, like, uh, you know, influence trying to be used against them. So how, how do you feel? How convinced do you feel by whatever... Uh, right. you know, strategies he or suggestions he has given. It's, it's all powerful stuff, but you know what? Uh, but it is something that needs to be again. I'm saying it needs to be practiced. It needs to be put in practice. And because you are going against the grain of consumer of human psychology, it will take a lot of conscious effort for you to put it into practice. But powerful stuff, nevertheless. Okay. Thanks. Huh. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Gaganpal uh, is asking me, that, did I apply uh, something? Uh, well, uh, no, it was not so, so much a case of uh, applying Gaganpal. It was more a case of uh, becoming aware to uh, how I have, uh, you know, through my career, used one or the other of these techniques many times uh, for for my marketing and mass communication so i i became aware of it so that consciousness is there now yeah okay uh Vinay. so um maybe i i my voice the background is not good i'll still try to make it now uh, when you talk of influencing and persuasion often it becomes a, a message to people that it is kind of manipulation but the way uh, this book has been talking and probably what you have shared is more about connectivity. It's like deep connectivity. Of course, when you use this connectivity for the wrong reason, things go in a different way. But the very premise when we understand is all about connectivity. And as we humans, uh, we really love to be connected. And if it is used in the right way, things can go in a very different tangent. So uh, I really want to thank you for uh, this, uh, Rajesh. Uh, and uh, I would not have really read this book because of other reasons, but but maybe you have presented and it's really, really phenomenal. Thank you so much for this initiative. My pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. So great guys, uh, I, I it, uh, it seems that uh, uh, we can call an end to this session. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, I, I saw some raised hand. Okay. So thank you so much for being here. And all those uh, here who are not yet a part of the Greeley Book Club can message me and uh, consider joining. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, these sessions regularly where we take up one book or the other. Then we have trainings and workshops. We have working vacations. So we um, uh, we have a lot of action, and there are a lot of actions. Uh, action there's a lot of action coming up now as well so thank you so much for thanks thanks part. rajesh thanks thanks, thanks. Thank, thank you rajesh ji thank you so much take care thanks. bye bye thank you thanks a lot bye. rajesh thank bye. you everyone bye. Bye. i will call you okay thank you thank you everyone